faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird brain. It's a plane. It's I, Walter. I, Walter. Yes, it's I, Walter. Strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. I, Walter, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend ears with his annoying voice, and who disguised as Walter Interanti, mild-mannered janitor for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, nonsense, and the American way. And now, another exciting episode in the adventures of I, Walter. All right, everyone. Hey, this is Walter from I, Walter. Um, I actually am using GarageBand, so I've had so many problems tonight, at least three more times, two or three more times. I did try to use Audacity, because that's normally what I use to do my podcast for most of them. I did use GarageBands in the past, but it never worked with my uh, setup. You know, this little amp box I use with the uh, XLR, XLR mic. So it is now 1 o'clock. I've been working on this since uh, later, well, let's see. I started around, I would say about 8 o'clock, or maybe that's when I got finished. But I actually started doing the editing um, earlier this afternoon, and it was stuff I had accumulated over the last couple of days. And, and now I'm, like, getting started at 1 o'clock on April 9th, Monday, April 9th, 2018. So please wish me luck. And hopefully this will be the last time. I, I had worked on a show this afternoon and lost everything. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure if this is recorded or not. Oh, God, maybe it's not. Um, yeah, it's difficult to see. I'm, I'm not seeing what's going on. Um, yeah, it's recording. Sorry about that. So I'm going to try this again. And hopefully, again, it's going to be the last time. I had uh, four segments tonight, actually. Four segments that I, you know, had, it's at least four. I'm not going to count them again because I've been counting them all night. Different things from Rush Limbaugh's show. One was actually, there was like, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's actually six. So there's probably five because the sixth one I'm not going to use. One was with Hillary Clinton. Uh, it was Rush talking a whole segment on on Hillary Clinton and... um it was so long. It was 32 minutes. I, I had to figure out, okay, I just got to use this one's just like incredibly long. I would recommend people to listen to it. It's basically him t uh, telling people how it's like the Democrats are all are very fed up with Hillary always complaining about everything. You know, even the Democrats just don't want to hear it any longer. So um, that one was, again, good, like 30. Some minutes of his show was actually an hour because there's a lot of commercials. So the thing was, though, he had uh, made this segment with no commercial breaks. It was talking for strictly, you know, straight through 32 minutes at least, if not longer. And it was kind of wild, but it uh, was way too long. I apologize. I keep on looking to make sure it's still recording. I don't know if it is or is not on because I'm not used to garage bands. I haven't used it in them quite a while. They did put some... Um, different perks in there, I guess, so to speak, whatever you call it. And again, I just got to get adjusted if I'm going to use this again, because Audacity is great, but I've just had too many problems just tonight. So I don't know. I probably eventually will go back to Audacity. It's just a much simpler program to use. Um, I hope someday I can. So anyway, uh, I'm going to give a shout out to friend at work, Rob. I uh, would be glad to, you know, be happy to have him on the show sometime. I don't know when. I hope this show again works out tonight uh, because I lost an hour's worth of work and recorded information. It was lost. So I'm not happy about that part. I'm very angry, actually. So there's a couple of things I talked about. I think that really, uh, you know, kind of reached out there and said some stuff and put some feeling in there. And it's not going to be there now because I'm just going to try to remember everything I did earlier uh, yesterday now. So. One thing I did start off with is was uh it was like uh the top movies and you know it was it was kind of a relief for me to see 
See, I don't even know I'm recording. Yeah, I guess I am. It was a relief for me to see like the top three movies at least. Maybe I should open up a little more now. Uh, see what the top ten are. I just want to make sure before I read them off. Okay, at least the th- the top three movies, by the way, are um, number one was A Quiet Place for this week, weekend. Number two was Ready Players One. That was number two. Blockers was number three, and number four was was uh, Black Panther. I'm, I apologize. I'm trying to look at it and worry about, it was, okay, is this going to be a problem? So the thing was, I, I, I'm glad that Black Panther is finally getting off the top list uh, because it, it's just been, I don't know, it's just been annoying that people keep on saying, oh, you got to see that because if you don't, you know, you must be racist or you don't like black people. So that's what I started saying. I, I'm not going to say it the same way I said the first time. And honestly, the reason I don't want to see it is because I'm, I'm not interested in the movie. That's that's the bottom line. I, didn't, I'm, I have no interest in seeing Black Panther. I mean, I've seen uh, quite a few, or had seen, had have saw, I don't know which one's the correct term terminology, uh, a lot of Marvel films, and a lot of them I just kind of had no uh, no desire to go see. There was a couple of these movies that were Marvel movies, and I'm trying to think what it was. And I, I just thought, like, okay, enough is, is enough. I, I can't see any more of these for a while. So, like, the mainstream ones, I guess. I guess all Marvel, Marvel movies are mainstream. The, the ones that everybody kind of recognize off the bat, Spider-Man. And um, I was almost going to say Batman. But, you know, movies that were comic books made into theatrical films. Let me put it that way because then I can expand it to Marvel and DC. You know, films like uh, Batman and um, Spider-Man, Superman, The Hawk. They're the ones I remember watching on TV, um, not only as cartoons, but as live action TV shows. So I'll go to those. I did not go see Nathir's Ant-Man. Captain America, I kind of knew about, so I went and seen that. Iron Man, I just I've heard so much about it over the years growing up that I went and seen that. But some of these other off, you know, beat films, I have no interest in seeing. And it's not because I'm racist. It's not because the main character is black. That's far from the truth. But they think that at work. And I, you know what? If it makes them happy and think I'm being uh, racial about it, then that's that's you, not me. So. It, to me, it's just ridiculous that anybody would think that way, but they do. So, um, yeah, that part's just very annoying. It's very irritating, but because um, there was films like that people never made a big deal out of you if you went and seen it or not that had a black person as the main hero. And for instance, what which I said before, nobody ever like scrutinized me if I didn't go see the Blade movies, and those I actually really enjoyed. Because I think I might have seen the first Blade movie in the theaters, but I don't think I did. The other two I did actually go out to the theaters to see because I just liked those. I I really liked Wesley Snipes. He was just really cool. In fact, I bought the TV series that they got some other actor to play the part, uh, Blade, and it was not Wesley Snipes. And I never watched it. It was like I bought it because I was really interested. I loved the movies. But, you know, and then I was mentioning before when I recorded a show earlier that got lost, there was also um, there was also another uh, movie that had a black actor play the main character of a vigilante because that's what pretty much also um, the other one I mentioned Blade is. He's he's a vigilante. He's not really a, a superhero, but it was based upon a graphic novel. The other one I used to I really liked was is Spawn. I couldn't get enough of that movie. And it was a black actor. It's based upon a black character who gets killed and sent to hell, but he comes he makes it out of hell. I'm not doing a very good um uh, you know thing whatever you want to call it all, about the movie or the comic. But he came back as a you know as um a uh, demon from hell, but he was he was a good guy. He was a vigilante again, killing the bad guys, something like that. 
but you never hear anything about that. But Black Panther, you know, since Marvel is such a, you know, money making cash cow at this point, you know, they had to be to me, it feels like they had to be politically correct and had to put out Black Panther. Now, I have a friend. He grew up with these comic books. He actually read Black Panther. He remember when it came out because he left me a voicemail the other day. My friend Todd. It's like, dude, I don't know anything about these comics, so why am I going to waste my money going to see it if I, I don't know what it's about? I mean, I like science fiction and horror, but there's a limit to what I'll be, really want to be go out and see. And a lot of it is because I just don't want to be bothered by other people pushing and kicking me in the chair. You know, it gets really old, you know, having people just being loud and boisterous and walking on top of you and kicking their chair and holding conversations. So, and, and movies are so expensive anymore. If you want to see it on a decent screen, you're talking like twenty, thirty dollars. You want to see it on a on a beat up screen, then you could probably get it for like ten or fifteen. But that's a lot of money for a movie. And the way I look at, it, unless it's something like I know everything about it, or I have, you know, some idea what it's about, then I'm not, then I'll put some money into it. Obviously. You know, things that I, I already know about. I don't know anything about this. I have really no interest in even seeing that new, I, what is it called, Avengers movie or something? No. Is it Avengers? So, you know, those movies and, like, the only other movie, like, because I think that's a different universe or is it not with Wolverine and stuff. I remember, like, I would see one or two. I didn't see them all in the theaters of the Wolverine movies and that whole group of uh, superheroes, because I, when I was a kid, a teenager, there would be kids that had those Wolverine comic books, and they were like the Bible to these kids. And I had no clue what they were reading. I mean, if it wasn't Richie Rich, I had no clue what it was about. Richie Rich and Casper and stuff, and Wendy the Witch. I, I didn't know anything about these other comics, and honestly... It was slightly interesting, but I, I had no desire to read them. So, And it's the same thing with these movies. I, I don't have a desire to see all these movies, but now that there's a a black guy in, in, in a superhero movie, yeah, you, you must go see that. It's a really good movie. Well, I don't know because I have no clue about the backstory. I've never read the comics, and I never had any interest in any of the Marvel comic books. I really had no interest in any superhero comic books. Like the TV shows, the only reason I go to these comic book movies is because you know i did grow up on these tv television programs that were made again on superman wonder woman and the incredible hawk so they were tv programs when i was a kid so i did go see i did watch those so that's like kind of different so you know whatever people want to think of me that's 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 on them not me so um let's see i can't tell where i'm at so this is gonna be kind of difficult i like I apologize to keep on going on about so I like the Audacity program because I can see how long I've been, you know, talking for this garage band thing is it's going to be a, a risk that I'm taking tonight because I don't want to do this show again. Well, at least, though, knock on wood, I can say, though, that what is it? Uh, it is at least using it's at least using my my um, my little box, my little unit. So that that makes me very happy. So um, I can kind of get an idea of how long I've been talking. I've been, I don't know, four minutes or something? I don't know. Who cares? It's a podcast. Nobody even listens to it anyway, so I don't care. Anyway, by the way, it was kind of interesting uh, earlier tonight when I tried to do my podcast. There is, you know, things I posted. I looked on Facebook. Hey, is there anything new I need to talk about before I play these little segments, which is going to be an experiment tonight, again, because I am using a different format, a different program, which I'm not familiar with anymore because they changed it so much, GarageBand. Um, or is it GarageBand? Um, but when I was pulling stuff up, there was this really hot-looking disc jockey, hot meaning a hot-looking woman. And um, so for those guys who... Th- may think, well, do you mean a hot guy or a hot woman? No, I mean a hot woman, hot young girl, whatever, woman. She's a disc jockey, and she's really damn good. So she advertises on all the social media, but she was on Facebook playing live for, like, literally nonstop for four hours. And let me 
tell you this, she was really good. She was really, really good. It reminded me when I was in my 20s and I'd go down to Philly to these Philly and somewhere else. There was another place. There's some place, I forget where it was, it was called Breakers. I actually went over King of Prussia, Valley Forge. Uh, there was a, a nightclub over there, and there was a Steven Singer, I think. Is there something, some joke about uh, a, a radio disc jockey who's got the same name? But this guy that I knew was a disc jockey with music named Steven, Steven Singer. I don't think it's the same guy, though. I don't know. I don't think it's the same guy. Anyway, um, he really, like, mixed music really well, and it was real cool, but I've never heard anybody that good. Minus, I hate to admit to this, but the guy who opened up for Demi Lovato, he's probably he's really popular, don't know the guy's name, and I don't remember, and I don't really care. He was really good. He really caught my attention, I'll tell you that much. So, um, where am I going with this? Well, Walter, do you know where you're going with this? No, no, actually, I don't. So, uh, yeah, this woman, her it looks like Mary, M-A-R-I, and it's definitely got to be an Italian name because the last name ends in an I, um, but it's spelled capital F, obviously, because it's her last name, E-R-R-A-R-I. Is that right? Anyway, whatever it is, however you pronounce it, she was, like, not only hot looking, she's really damn good. So that's that's a double plus in my book. Let me make sure I turned off my. What are the things people like about I, the omnibus bill? Okay, I apologize about that. I opened up something and didn't realize that I had the sound on my other computer. I have two computers in front of me right now. One's running my podcast, and one is for my news segments. So anyway, um, I'm going to shut these. Non, um, I want. I'm going to say this wrong word wrong. Se- sequential information and go to what I have left. I have something from my friend Rob at work. He uses some link called Newsy, and I should have checked where it was, but you know what? With all these shenanigans going on tonight, I forget it, and I did not. Um, yeah, and I got to see how to figure out how to uh, glue things in on what I'm recording now so I won't mess it up also. Um, because I might be doing this podcast again for all I know for like a sixth or seventh time tonight. But um, a couple of the highlights I wanted to mention was it was on Thursday. I was listening to Rush and there was a lot of good information. Friday was really good, but I didn't quite go through it the same way I did on Thursday's show. When I was listening to it, I, I like, whoa, I got to write this down. I got to write some post-it notes. So I did. And one was like on a second hour where Rush was talking to a school teacher about Christians under attack with this new pagan, pagan, you know, like the pagans, the people who believe in witchcraft kind of pagans, I guess, um, or, you know, which is pretty much in our country now is the liberal left is what he was referring to, how they are just attacking Christians. Uh, there's a segment on that because I'm reading my cliff notes. And then Rush Limbaugh talks about change, uh, the change in the the minds of uh, of little children in, in these schools at, like, second grade. It was in, I thought they said it was North Carolina. I can't remember because I wrote a little note. Children into sexual, uh, being turned into sexual perverts. And that was on uh, Thursday as well. So, but these were like clips I cut and, you know, I put them aside and hopefully sound okay. And then I I actually, when I was looking for stories, I found like it came up on Fox News earlier yesterday. Um, It was, it said Berlin half marathon attack plot foiled in six detained who had caused, tried to cause a terrorist attack. This was in Berlin. And uh, um, there was more to the story. So, yeah, it was Sunday. German authorities said there was like uh, there was attack. There was an isolated in um, indications that those arrested age ages between 18 and 21 years old were participating in a. 
um, preparation of crime in connection with this event, prosecutors and police wrote in a joint statement. So there's uh, you're going to read about it, you're going to hear about it, because it's Monday now, so you're going to obviously hear about it. So I thought it was kind of interesting, like this came up, you know, this is why I believe that Trump is trying to strengthen our walls, not make them weaker, even though a lot of people from the left would love to see weaker walls and more illegal immigration, more people from other countries come in illegally because that way they get more voters. They don't and more money in their pockets somehow. So they don't really care how by being politically correct and also being politically correct and also doing things without much thought is in danger in many people's lives. Just to, you know, what I, I want to say forward your their agenda. Maybe that's not the right way of saying it, but I'm going to say it that way tonight because I'm I'm very tired too. So anyway, there was there was there was that I mentioned earlier, and then it got destroyed. Another thing was because I want to get to these segments, and hopefully I can pray. I can I'm going to pray to God that I'll be able to successfully import this stuff into my show and then discuss it as I listen to it. Um, so it was funny to see this earlier yesterday on the New York Post by this guy named, I want to say John Crudell or something, um, who wrote for the New York Post this article. And it's, he titled it, Why Haven't, Haven't the uh, Cheating FBI Lovebirds Been Fired Yet? And that's a very good question. So this guy is like, you know, and I think, personally, I think the New York Post has got to be a, a leftist paper anyway, but it's just funny. Even the left's getting annoyed by certain things going on in our country, you know, that's been going on. And I guess sometimes maybe certain people either were just too afraid to talk about it or it was just everything was going their way. Now that it's not, now they they, they are starting to um, wise up a little bit, not a lot. I don't know. I have no clue. So I said, I find it amazing, this this guy who wrote this article, that Peter Stroke and Lisa Page, those Trump-hating, spouse-cheating FBI lovebirds, haven't been fired yet, even though they greatly compromised the probe into Hillary Clinton's mishandling of her government emails. So these people were supposed to be investigating Hillary Clinton, but in fact, they were actually pro-Hillary and anti-Trump people, these FBI agents. They were having an affair with each other, but they were married to other uh, spouses or whatever you want to say, and um, they deliberately just um, did everything to make Hillary look innocent or just cover up information, basically, and make Trump in any way they could look like guilty, which pretty much backfired but they didn't get fired for this they, they, they you know they, they got it all everything got botched up but it didn't stop them from losing their jobs and it didn't take away from their what is it their credibility i don't know okay this guy writes what uh this john crudell he said what's even more ast- um astonishing is that the source tells me that neither has lost security clearance despite being demoted. I'm told that the clearances um, are routinely routinely pulled even when someone is caught having an external affair. Uh, the FBI did not return calls for comments, but so these people didn't lose anything as far as security um, measures. They They still have all their... You know, they, they got demoted slightly, but it was basically, I guess, the best way to put it, because I'm doing such a horrible job trying to explain this, I I apologize, is that they basically got a slap on the wrist. That's what it sounds like to me. So, nice going, you know. And I'm not going to say it's it's the Trump administration. No, it's not him. It's it's the left who basically support these people still. I think, and somehow, because we got a we got a mixture of Democrats and Republicans in it, in uh, in these seats still. So that's always going to be that way. But unfortunately, that's a bad thing too. Because I'm assuming that's that's what's making these 
um, decisions on these people. I know this is the FBI, but that's part of the government, right? So anyway, um, yeah, I don't know how this is. I got to really get used to this damn garage bands program. I've never used it before, so I, I'm hoping it's working okay. So anyway, I want to get back to what Rob had sent me, uh, Rob from work. So thank you uh, from Newsy. He had taken this post from Newsy. I've never heard of it. And he basically highlighted what he thought I could use for my podcast. So I'm going to use it now. And it says, Trump, illegal immigration, 46 years low, is at a 46-year low. Unemployment, lowest ever for blacks and Hispanics, for everyone else, lowest in decades. So the amount of unemployment right now is at an all-time low for blacks, Hispanics, and everyone else. Now, the funny thing is, when, um, I was going to say Donald Trump, when President Barack Obama was in office, it was at a, actually the opposite. It was at an all time high for everyone, you know, because they made that statement on the news all the time. Well, just don't take it as you're unemployed. Take it as fun employment because you have more time you can spend with your friends and family now. That that time that you didn't have before, now you have it back. That's a bunch of bullshit. I'm sorry. So anyway, and it says the stock market up forty percent since election of Donald Trump. Now. People are going to say, well, actually, the stock market has been pretty low lately. Like, I think the last two Fridays in a row, it's been pretty bad. But you are talking about the stock market, and the stock market is like a roller coaster. It is always up and down. So that that's the bottom line. So it, it also says, it's a list of things. I'm going to read down them. ISIS lost its last two cities. ISIS, you know, the terrorist coalition. Real median household income at an all-time high means it or say, so I'm not going to say it because I did this before. I made this mistake. I, I kind of explained it, and then it explains it later on. Consumer, consumer confidence highest in decades, which is true. Tax Cuts and Job Act. This is where it comes in why household income is higher. Tax Cuts and Job Act is saving 90% of its wage earners more take-home pay, corporate tax re- a rate reduction from 35% to 21% resulting in hundreds of bonuses and wage increases. Investments coming back to the U.S., such as Apple, is uh, re-perpetrating over $3 billion. So I was mentioning this in a lot more depth and detail earlier Um that Apple is now going to take a lot of their business back to the U.S., which before they had sent it overseas, their factories and stuff, to do the work. Because one, yes, it's cheaper labor, but two, because it was just too goddamn expensive. So pardon me on that. I Forgive me. I, you know, what I just said. But no, seriously, and I am, you know, the, you know, it's just too costly. That's why a lot of companies had packed up and and had taken their business overseas for manufacturing. It was just too expensive. Now it's actually going to be because of tax breaks. And, um, yeah, mainly, well, it's going to be tax breaks, but then they're also going to put a tariff on things getting imported. So it's it's more of an incentive to do more business in, in, um, in our country, not overseas, which is a good thing. That means more people are going to have to, are going to be able to work in our country. Hopefully, legal people, legal citizens. And it's uh, anyway, the next one says Assad's airbag attack after using chemical weapons, unlike Obama, who did nothing when the same thing happened during his term. I'm not sure what that's about. Assad's airbag. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say airbag? That was really dumb of me. Assad's airbase attack after using chemical weapons, unlike Obama who did nothing in caps when the same thing happened during his term. So what I'm gathering, because there must have been more, but that's what was highlighted, is that Trump is actually, he's not this pussyfooting around. He's actually, hey, if you're going to attack us or one of our U.S. bases, uh, military base um, facilities, I'm not going to take it standing down. I'm going to do something back. So don't fuck with us, basically. 
Uh, last one is North Korea is talking with South Korea and floating the possibility of giving up their nukes after unprecedented pressure from sanctions and military. And he does want to, Trump wants to increase the military factor. Um, he actually wants to strengthen the borders too with the Coast Guards. I remember reading that and hearing it on the, on the radio the other day. That's really good. He wants to go down. I forget if it was Texas or somewhere else where it's really be, uh, weak borders. Our border is very weak and not very well manned. Uh, that's where he wants to strengthen or, you know, yeah, strengthen the walls. Because so I'm, I'm sure there is some border wall. There is some places there is no wall at all, which Trump wants to build a wall across certain areas where the amount of illegal immigrants just basically walking from one country to the next, like literally just walk in the border over the border because there is no wall or just very weak foundations or not very well structured. He's going to strengthen those, but he's also going to add, um, what do you call it? He's going to add more coast guards or, you know, send more coast guards down to the, this one particular area. I heard it on the radio the other day. I just can't remember where exactly it was now. So I apologize. You will hear hear about it now that it's the beginning of a new week, so that that will be good. Um, going back to Apple real, real quick, because I did mention this earlier, and I, I, I've, I, I'm i not sure how this is going to work out. So if it does, this is going to be wonderful because it will be my first show after a month. If not, then it's going to be not heard, so it's not going to be a big deal. But I was talking about earlier how Apple, one of the other things they are planning to do in the next two or uh, three years at least – in the next three years. And I read some articles when Apple says they're going to do something, they kind of do it. Well, not kind of, they really do do it. So it's going to be a problem because Apple wants to change their CPUs and their desktops from Intel based computers. And it's also the same with their laptops. So it'd be laptops and their desktops. They want to change it to their own thing, which is this arm chip that's, you know, exists already in their phones and their iPads. So what's the big deal about that? Well, it is a big deal because unfortunately, once they do that, it might even be in the Apple TV because I have that too. When they do that, it's going to create a problem where if you're using any Intel-based software, which is like certain programs that you might have that I have, and your OS is no longer going to be, uh, it's not going to work. Because I had this issue years ago. When I first jumped on board having an Apple, it was with a G3. And I loved the thing. It was a Mac Snow. And then eventually I went to a G4, and I can't remember what I had at that point. And then the G5, which my very first Apple Mac Pro, the cheese grater one, my very first one I had, was actually a G5. And it had this special air induction on the side because it got really hot. It got really, really hot. And I looked earlier, and I wasn't sure. I thought it was IBM who made the processors for Apple, but I think I was wrong, and I didn't check it to figure out what who made these Power PCs or Power Macs, they were called, not Power PCs. And it was actually, I think, Motorola made uh, the uh, CPUs for Apple. For years, for a long time, for a very, very long time. So, hey, that's great. But there was an issue with that, too, where they got to the point that, hey, we need faster and more efficient CPUs. Now, CPU, by the way, means central processing unit. And, um, you know, they couldn't keep up if it is Motorola or if it was IBM. I thought it was IBM at one point. Who made these power um power max the uh, the c p u for the power max either one they couldn't keep up with what uh what a- oops, sorry about that what apple has re- had requested so Apple you know said hey we're gonna have to look for somebody else to make our c p u s because you're not keeping up what we need and it's not getting any better so they actually went to Intel I wish they would have went to a m d but they went to Intel because Intel was a very big company. And, um, you know, hey, that's great. That's great. So 
The problem is, though, um, Intel now, they, they, they want to do, you know, kind of step back from Intel. And now they want to actually make their own CPUs. And I think actually on the iPads and the phones, obviously, I guess, they make their own GPUs as well. Now, what's a GPU? That's a graphics, what is it, GPU, graphic processing unit? I don't know. I'm not really sure what it stands for. It's your graphics, um, you know, it's a separate um, processor. You know, you have Intel, you have the i7. There is actually an i9 now, by the way. There's an i9, i7, i5, and an i3. They're all the Intel well-known chips. Everybody's heard of them. Maybe not the i9. And Intel decided, well, we're going to start making all-in-one chips that have both. Not only do you know the the you know the mathematics or whatever you want to call it, the, the processing of what's going on on your desktop. We also want to make our own GPU, which is your graphics. We want to make a all-in-one chip. Well, AMD did the same thing, but AMD won actually smarter because they actually bought this Canadian company that was called ATI, who made Radeon process or GPUs, graphics chips. And they're still around the the branded name Radeon, but that was that was like what they came out with. I don't know what the ATI made before Radeons. Radeon was something they made at least 20, 30 years ago, but that name is going to stick forever now, I guess. I, I assume, because um, ATI got bought out by AMD, and AMD did that so they could make um, an all-in-one chip where they have a multi-core CPU with graphics built into it. So that makes it very, very affordable and very cheap. Unfortunately, AMD is, you know, at one time they were actually um, on top of Intel. Like they were making better CPUs than Intel. Now they're really not. They're they're like second best, but they're not bad. They're actually pretty good depending on what you want to use it for, what kind of, you know, what kind of programs. Basically, that's a, you know, PC-based processor is AMD, and they're not bad, but they do make pretty damn good um, all-in-one chips that have your GPU and CPU. But anyway, um, yeah, if Apple gets away with this, because I I once again did this earlier, and I'm doing it again, I mean, as I'm going astray from what I was trying to get to the point with Apple, if Apple actually goes the direction they want to do, which they will, and they make their own all in one. I, I'm afraid right now because they've been holding out right now on their new Mac Pro. They're going to get away with the one I have, which is called the Trash Bin Mac Pro. They're going to they're going to do away with that. They're going to say, you know, no longer it's going to it's going to be like the tissue box from years ago. There was that Mac Cube they made years ago. I think it was called the Mac Cube. I had one. I had my one friend Rich rebuilt one for me. I bought all the parts. He put it together. He, he was like fighting tooth now to get this damn thing to look brand new for me because I'm very anal about things that were, you know, old. And the Cube, when I actually got my hands on one, I could afford one. It was, like, already obsolete. It hasn't wasn't being used in centuries almost at that point. So Rich helped me build one um, or rebuild it, I guess. Re, you know, basically make it look brand spanking new and act like a brand new one. But yeah, that's what's what's going to happen with the Mac Pro desktop now that looks like a trash bin. It's going to be history in the next few years. It's going to be like nobody's going to want them anymore. Because Apple, it feels like, or at least other people are convinced that Apple made a big mistake on the Mac Pro desktop. I thought the same at first because they're very expensive. I think they start at $3,000 and they go up to $10,000. And that's a lot of money. But actually, the units were not that bad of a design. It actually is really good um, because I have 16 terabytes running into it from two external hard drives. I've never had a problem with that. The desktop itself ran runs perfectly. I've never really had any serious issues. So I can't really say anything bad about it. That That's the problem. I really cannot say much bad about it or anything bad about it. But people like to upgrade. I do too. The the convenient thing about the desktop I have now is you really can't do too much um, upgrading. But 
it will last. It's last me quite a few years already. Not a lot, but a couple years. Quite a few. Going back to that phrase, quite a few. Um, and I was actually pleasantly surprised because I got this one. I think it was a little over $2,000 because I got one that was refurbished. And honestly, it's knock on wood. It's been running beautifully. Had a lot less problems. I would have still had my old Mac computer, but I accidentally spilled water all over it, and it actually got inside the case, and everything got pretty much destroyed. So I I couldn't salvage anything. I was like, okay, this is garbage now. No puns intended on the look of my new one, my new Mac. But it runs perfect. It runs nice. It runs smooth. It's fast. That's what I want. And never had any major issues. In fact, I wouldn't even know how to run an older Mac that looked like the cheese grater any longer because I'm, I'm so used to the Mac Pro I have now, desktop. So the problem is they're supposed to put out another Mac Pro. This is what I'm trying to get at. They haven't said anything yet. They're keeping everything so tight that nobody has an idea what this new upgradable Mac Pro desktop is going to be like. They did put out what was called a iMac Pro, which is a professional all-in-one Mac and that starts at five thousand dollars, and that goes up to ten grand. So it's like state of the art. People who bought them, um, you could buy one if you have a micro center around you for like a thousand dollars a less. So instead of costing five grand, it costs you like four thousand. Still a lot of money though. But the people who are like serious users, people who use it for business, graphics design and editing say it's like the best thing since sliced bread, the new iMac Pro. But they've been really keeping hush-hush anything about this possible new desktop that will replace the one I have, the, the Mac Pro I have. Now, my worry, my concern is, who knows, it might have this new ARM chip that they've been talking about. And if they do, um, that's going to be the first step of Apple like slowly moving away from Intel completely, and everything in the system will be all the hardware, not just certain parts, all the hardware where will eventually be all um, Apple branded. So there will be nothing in that machine that is actually some other companies. It's going to be a complete Apple machine, which is good for them. Um, It's good for probably other things too. But it's also going to make everything you have, as far as software is concerned, um, non-usable. So that's a concern of mine. Alrighty, I talked about that long enough. And unfortunately, like I said, I'm using GarageBand, so I don't know where I'm at. So usually I can kind of, you know, guesstimate where, okay, hey, Walter, where are you at right now? Well, I have no clue. So, And I don't know how long it can run, because my shows usually run a couple hours. So. I don't even know where I'm at. So anyway, I'm going to try to import um, some segments, and hopefully I can do this successfully with no problem, because otherwise I'll be very pissed. And sorry, I'm moving my mic over and see what I want to pull up first in my magical um, desktop, all my magical desktop. I was going to play first the shortest clip, which is Hillary... Um, Rush talking about Hillary, like the short little little clip I got. It's it looks like twenty three seconds actually. You know, wearing the victim hat that was pretty funny. You know, when he refers to Hillary wearing a victim hat, he's referring to her wearing the vagina hat. You know, because she, Hillary Clinton, is a very strong woman when she wants to be. She is a excuse me a very strong woman, and um. You know, when she doesn't get her way, then she either eliminates that person, literally eliminates them, like they no longer are alive, or, you know, she doesn't do it, you know, herself. She gets somebody else to do it for her, her dirty work. And, um, you know, you know, she acts like she's a helpless female, which this is going to go into something like I, I mentioned this before with work. But let me play this segment first to see if I can do this correctly. I'm hoping I can, and I want to listen to it again myself, and then I'll go into more detail. So I'm going to play this now and see if I can do this on GarageBand. So wish me luck, because I really will need it. 
because Hillary Clinton perfectly represents a party of victims. Man, if there is if there's ever been a prototype and an icon for a victim, a Democrat Party victim, Hillary Clinton is owning it. She's wearing the hat. Okay, so far it seems like it's working pretty good, Garage Bands. They did change a lot on here. I'm not even familiar with how much they changed this. So knock on wood, I think it worked okay. So that'll be good for me. Um so that was the first thing, and yeah, I do have a little bit to talk about with that. The reason I picked that Hillary Clinton thing, because see, I work, you know, at a place that there's a lot of women who have really high end jobs and they act they themselves act like victims. And you know what? I I don't buy that. And we have one uh, person in particular, so I am like spitting into the mic now. One person in particular, she's a she's a boss's boss. You know, she's a higher up. And when it's convenient for her, I mentioned this earlier, um, you know, when it's convenient for her, she makes herself victimized. Um, she's like afraid of me. She acts like a scared rabbit when she sees me. She keeps her distance. She walks away. She acts like I'm going to attack her. And it's like that's very immature and very unprofessional. So that is one thing that, you know, it, it kind of really bothers me that people are that kind of immature because that's exactly what it is. And I'm trying to think of how I said this earlier. But, yeah, it's it's very irritating. It's very, very, very annoying. Um, and I have some people that, that are females at work, too. Um, certain guys that are my coworkers would kind of agree with this. I, um, if they're not too afraid to, they would agree with me. I think I'm sure they would. I don't know, but you know, there's these girls that they, their, their important thing is, you know, they want equal pay and to do the same job that any man can do because otherwise it's discriminatory. But yet when it comes to doing really physical hard work, when it comes down to it, they then they don't want to do it. Now, there's like one or two people. That's about all I can think of. Maybe one or two people that are females that really will you know, show that, hey, I can do more work than you can do. But I have other ones that I people I work with that are females that they... Their whole thing is, and and same thing with guys. There's guys, I hate to say it, but there's guys at my job that are, you know, I don't know how else to put it. I'll just bluntly say out, they're pussy whipped. Like, they 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 basically follow the girls around like um, puppy dogs, lost puppy dogs. And it's very irritating with that, too. Um, It kind of reminds me, I mentioned this earlier, and I'm going to mention it again because I have a couple more tracks I want to play. I mean, tracks some sound clips I want to play where it reminds me when I was in high school, like, cause some of these females at my job, they're just brutally, um, they're like bullies to like me and to other guys, other fellow employees. And I've seen it myself. I I've experienced it at my job myself. And if you kind of fight back, then they act like, Oh, this guy's picking on me. This is not fair. You know, oh, poor me. I'm just a helpless female. Why why is he picking on me? It's like you're the one doing all the bully and not me. So it's it's just like the whole thing reminds me, bottom line, it was when I'm in high school. When I was in high school. I do gotta play this one next clip. I'm gonna play. I'm trying to think. Um Oh, the perversions in school. That's going to be the next one I'm going to play. That one's pretty long, too. The longest one I have tonight, by the way, is the Modern Pagans. That one's actually really good. They're all very good, so I'm just saying, you know. But to get back to this, I, there's, you know, the these. it seems like with the women at our job, I hate to say it, their whole thing is social events, chit-chatting. I mean, I hate to say this. I'm not trying to be ignorant. I'm just being what I see. And I see guys that just are the same way, too, but it's not as bad the level as it's with the females. We got some lazy people where I work, but 
Um, I'm not saying the women are lazy. I'm just saying they like to talk and do a lot. Like they like to move their mouths more than they like to actually physically work. Not all of them, but some of them are very lazy. I'm sorry to say. I apologize. It came out. It's, it's the way I think. And it's very irritating, but, um, you know, having higher up people, and I do get this um, very curt, childish way from adult management and females as well, management and, and coworkers. Like, their whole thing is social media, talking to others, where you want to get lunch or dinner tonight, you know, as a group of people. And it's like, can you kind of think a little bit a little bit more intelligently than just like you're in high school still, not even in college, but in high school. And and you're talking women and men in their thirties, forties, fifties and up. And they're acting like big overgrown children. They have their clicks. They, um, and and it's a shame because the company I work for is a fortune, you know, what is it, like a multi-million dollar company, probably a multi-billion dollar company, and you have people who act, like, pathetic. And um, just really don't know how to act like a mature adult. In fact, they want to act like um, Hillary, who is kind of like a smart woman, but, you know, like Hillary, these people at work, certain ones, you know, are just big crybabies, or, you know, if they don't get their way, they're upset. Um, they take advantage of other people and they bully. So, because I think it was a couple months back, I did a a podcast talking about that. You know, bullying at work because it's just as bad as you know. You know, you can have people who bully you in in high school, middle school, even college. But yeah, you can have it in your workplace too, and that's where I I find it most irritating too. So. Um, yeah, so that that's one thing I, I definitely need to address or mention tonight. It's it's very irritating. Like, you know, you have a higher up and she runs the other way. Um, she just ignores you. Um, a particular higher up, it's a female. And you're supposed to be, like, you know, well-spoken for, very intelligent. You know, you're, you're holding all the cards in your hand and you're making the determination um, on a global perspective, if you like to admit to it or not, of what's going to happen on what we're working on. And what do you do? You act like you're still in high school or you're in grade school. I mean, that's that's like ridiculous, and it's very irritating. We have um, guys and girls, you know, guys who have to kiss up to the females, and they're not girls, they're women and men, who act like guys and girls. Um, I did say this earlier, so I'm going to say it again, because I remember years ago I had a college course, and it was when I was in what's called human services. And it was um, it was uh, a class, marriage and the family. And now this woman was very strong-willed, this professor I had back in the day. I had this class called marriage and the family. And she put it so perfectly. So I hope I don't cause myself bad karma because I think it was around when I mentioned this when I was recording the show earlier that got lost that everything had taken a crap. She basically uh, said years ago, there is certain men and women who just don't want to grow up. They act like children. And she called them in our class. She called them suffering from perpetual adolescence. And I believe it was marriage in the family. It was one of my sociology classes because I basically majored in psych classes and social classes because human services is uh, human services is a counseling uh, course. I mean, it's a class. The classes you take is to become a counselor. Um, I think sometimes they used to be called MHTs or some one of the positions, but that's like a four year possibly possibly going to graduate school. And for those who don't know, uh, MHT stands for Mental Health Technician. So I was going towards that direction, but there was actually no money in that. You could probably make more money. At, well, yeah, you could make more money, believe it or not, working at McDonald's, Burger King, or definitely Walmart than you can going for a 
graduate degree in uh, ment- to become a mental health technician. That's really bad because it's very stressful. You get you definitely get burned out too. By the way, so um, yeah, yeah, you're you're better off trying to go for a job at, at Walmart without a degree than you will going for you know what is that? It's four years for your undergrad and three years or two years for your other one. So that's what, six to seven years to get less money and more stress. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That's what I want to go for. No, seriously, I liked it. I really found the classes interesting, the courses. But that one professor I had who called people who just don't want to grow up, uh, people who suffered from perpetual adolescence, it's just so perfect at my job that I work now. And it was funny because I was, and that was another thing I have an issue with that I mentioned. So, again, I hope I don't cause a explosion on my laptop that I'm recording the show because this is what caused my bad luck from the last time. But I mentioned I worked at this place years ago. It was called I Got It at Gary's. People from around my area of Philadelphia area, outskirts of Philly, would know what this place is. It was a glorified drugstore. Like it had everything you know, the drugstore part of the store, it was a very small, but it was more like, uh, have you ever heard of Happy Harry's, I think, and some other places that like had everything. It was like a novelty store that sold drugs, you know, dr- legal drugs, by the way. And it was really fun to shop in. That was the whole point. So it, you drew a lot of people in because you could basically get your groceries and everything else. And your, you know, you can do that at Walmart now, but no, Gary's was really cool. It was, it was the shit back in the day. That's where you wanted to go shop, and it was fun. It was like going to an amusement park when you went in there. And, you know, I worked with a lot of kids, 15-year-olds. Um, yeah, they were 15 with working papers, most of them. I was 22, 23 years old. And I mentioned this before, but especially the girls, they would dress in these really tight, um, you know, same thing as with... Women wear now as pants, but it was spandex, you know, some type of elastic dress that literally just hugged their ass on these young girls, 15, 16 years old. And then they would wear halter tops. So there was two Gary's, by the way. It was called I Got It Gary's with an apostrophe S, which I don't, it me kind of, I'm really bad with stuff, but I think that's not correct, the way, the correct way to do it. Because the place was called I Got It at Gary's with an apostrophe, yes. But anyway, you had these young girls in there, and they would wear, like, uh, really low-cut dresses. Um, It would basically make their ass look very round, and it would just hug their ass. Um, You could see their panty line because they were so short. I wish I was kidding about that. I enjoyed it. The management, the younger guys that were managers enjoyed it. I know they're only 15, 16. Well, Walter, you should go to, you're going to go to jail for that. Well, that was like 30 years ago. So people didn't make a big deal out of it then. And I didn't ask, hey, why don't you wear a, um, a halter top and a spandex dress where your, your ass cheeks are hanging out and you can see your panty line through either the dress or the bottom of it because it was so short. Well, a lot of customers, believe it or not, they got very offended by that. And so did it both Gary's because they got complaints about it. And that's the last thing you want done. So Gary actually, both of them, Gary Wolf, Gary Rissler, that was their names, um, made a, you know, told the management, hey, you got to tell these girls they can't come in. They're going to get sent home. The next time one of them come in in a halter top, which they did, and these spandex dresses that like, you know, I used to see him in clubs when you I used to go to this place called um, Shadows over King of Prussia. The the cocktail waitresses wore the same thing. And it looked really good on them. Of course, they were legal, too. So that definitely helped these cocktail waitresses because it was an open bar. But, yeah, these girls would dress like that. And why am I bringing all this up? Well, the people at work, these 30-something-year-olds, 40-something-year-olds, and 50-something-year-old women and older dress not exactly like with halter tops, but very close, but they wear the same kind of clothes that these 15-year-olds would wear years ago. You know, they would dress like, the bottom line is you got these women who are married, most of them, got boyfriends or whatever you want to call it, significant others. 
And they dress like they're 15 years old. That's my point. And they act like they're 15 years old. And if you try to hold the conversation with them, it's like, I feel like I'm back in um, the 80s with the Valley Girls. Like, oh, my God, you're like talking to me, you know, and it's like you're a grown adult acting like a fucking five year old or 15 year old girl. You're a grown fucking woman. Act like one and don't act like a scared rabbit either. That's the kind of stuff, by the way, that I deal with that people don't understand. Now, I think I mentioned this earlier, and this is another irritation on my part, um, a problem thing that bothers me. See, years ago, when you know I had a girlfriend or something, I was only in my 20s when I was able to get girlfriends. Yeah, a lot of this stuff didn't bother, as, bother me as much because I hear that from people. Well, you know, just don't take it that seriously. Well, you know what? You have some way to kind of get your mind off of these idiots at your job, my job. I don't have that kind of uh, convenience anymore. I don't have a girlfriend. I don't have any female friends. Because I had some female friends that were definitely, it was nice to talk to them. It was kind of like you need that companionship. Even if it's not a sexual companionship, you need something other than just other guys. Because that gets very frustrating. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. But it do, it really does. So it's nice to have a female companion of some sort. It, it kind of, this kind of, defuses um you know i don't want to say sexual frustration but it definitely defuses a little bit of the frustration part um but i don't have that anymore and my parents just annoy me i love them to death but they 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 just definitely just get in my under my skin they do so much for me but it's not the same type of um what do you call it way of venting Oh, um, my frustration as it is with someone closer to my age or someone who is a friend of the opposite sex. There's, there's, a, there's a difference. So the people who tell you, oh, don't take it seriously, I hate to tell you, A, they have a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend if it's a girl, um, or they are married, or they are married and they are, have a, a boyfriend and girlfriend on the side. So they those kind of people just don't really understand that. They don't really care. Minus, I think, about two of my friends. They don't have girlfriends either, but um, I don't know how they deal with it. But, you know, most human beings need some type of, you know, some type of rapport with somebody of the opposite sex. It just that's the way nature has designed us. So I kind of mentioned that differently earlier, but, you know, I think that might maybe change my mind. But as far as getting as angry as I do, will will it change my mind? Otherwise, probably not. I hate to tell you, I still will complain about it somehow. Not to the level I do now. I will say that much. So anyway, before I go any further, since I do have a couple sound clips, there is almost a good 30 minutes. Um, if you add them all together, maybe a little longer than that of sound clips. That's why I want to play them as well. So give me a moment and I will play the next one. And I think the next one I do want to play, I'm trying to look at it without taking my, my mouth off the mic. Um, I think I will play the one, like I mentioned earlier. Well, I'm going to play them all. Don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm going to play them all. I would like to play the one that's actually about Rush and the sexual perversion with children in second grade in this particular high school or middle school, whatever you call it. What's second grade? Is that middle school? It also goes on to talking about uh, white privilege, which I think is totally stupid. I have a separate segment strictly about white privilege, but this one kind of covers both. Um, and they're all five of them or six, whatever it is, five, four, all these sound clips are all from Rush Limbaugh's show on Thursday. Cause there was a lot of good stuff. Like I said, so let me play the one on the sexual perversion, but it does go into a little bit of something about white privilege, which to me, it's just, again, another way of some group of people, whatever you want to say, who need to feel 
compelled to victimize themselves. That's that's very irritating. That really is. Well, Walter, you complain about women all the time and other people. Well, you know what? I'm a human being, too. I'm complaining about people because they are affecting the way I work and my my health. They're actually affecting my health. I'm not affecting these other people because I don't know who they are and they don't know who I am. So on that level, I don't care. I, I think it's kind of different. Maybe you don't think it's different. I think it's kind of different. Anyway, I'm just going to babble on for hours about this. So I'm just going to go ahead and play this segment on how the schools are um, turning these young children. I'm trying to say young children's school uh, skulls full skull of mush, something like that. Rush refers to people who are not developed, you know, their brains aren't developed fully, like younger children, younger people. He calls them young skulls full of mush. And I can't say that right. So I actually, I think I did say it correctly that time. So let me display this segment because it is a bit long. I actually want to listen to it myself. So here we go. The one on... Schools changing children into perverts. To the story in Raleigh. And this is the story about second graders at a school in Raleigh. It's it's a grade school being exposed to lessons on white privilege. Children at, these are, these are eight-year-olds, these are second graders, are given lessons on white privilege. One parent has spoken out about it. One parent at least is reported to have spoken out about it. It's very outraged, saying, you have no business teaching my kid that there's something wrong with him because he's white. You've got no business. You've got no business teaching. Racism is eight years old. This is not your purview. It's mine as his mother. The leftists in the school are trying to slough this off on and say the PTA is doing it and that these lessons that are being sent home are not really for the students, they're for the parents. Which is a crock. They are expressly for the students. And when they get caught, they do two things. They blame it on the PTA and then claim it's not for the student. It's for you parents to see. We want you to know what we should be doing and what we're doing here. And I mentioned that one of the elements of the white privilege lessons is to break down various jobs and positions and have the corresponding percentage of those jobs filled by white people. Here's the list. According to this lesson plan at this Raleigh High School on white privilege, by the way, colorblindness, is taught as a bad thing. You're not, you, no, no, no. You want to be the opposite of colorblind. You want to notice the white privilege. You want to learn about the white privilege. You want to understand you're being taught, they're being taught that white privilege is really the root of all of the inequality, the discrimination, the inequity in this country. It all stems from white privilege, which is simply a new way of attacking the so-called majority. So here are data points the students are given to back up the claim that white privilege is bad, that it's pervasive and discriminatory. It's a list of jobs or positions. Congress, 90% white. Governors, 96% white. Top military advisors, 100% white. President and vice president, 100% white. Current presidential cabinet, 91% white. People who decide which TV shows we see, 93% white. Owners of men's pro football teams, 97% white. This is sort of an introductory lesson into understanding white privilege. So along with this, we have sexual perversion being taught under the guise of anti-bullying programs sponsored by Planned Parenthood in a number of public schools across the country. And enough parents have noticed that they are staging a walkout on April the 23rd over this. Now, you, I doubt you're seeing any of this in the drive-by media. 
which is why I wanted to take some time to talk about it today, because cultural deprivation, cultural rot is one of the areas that worries me the most as far as the future of our country is concerned. Politics is what it is, and we see it each and every day, and it's there to be seen. I mean, many of the left's tricks have been exposed, and it's all on television. This stuff is subtle. And if you don't have kids in the second grade these days, if your kids are are older or you don't have kids at all, you may not even be aware this is going on. But this this is how you infect the bloodstream that is our culture. And so that you get started early enough with uh, with all these kinds of things. One of the things you're doing, and you know, my email, why, Mr. Limbaugh, why? What's the goal? What's the benefit of turning second graders into perverts? What's the goal in turning sixth and seventh graders into sexual deviants? Why do these people want to produce weird, perverted, unhealthy people? I can only guess on the sexual side. I, th- I, think it, I think it all boils down to power and control. Now, obviously, there are many possible explanations for this. But given how the left politicizes everything, I think this is about ultimately making people messed up and unable to get through life on their own. It's about preparing them and conditioning them to become victims and to end up being anti majority anti whatever is normal i think you have basically a bunch of unhappy angry people who want as many other people to be as unhappy and angry as they are and to have the same grievances but beyond that it's a crapshoot because i can't relate to it i mean i don't think most of you can either so i'm simply guessing as to what the possible objective here is. But one thing you can rule out, this is not good. It's, it's, it's not helping anybody improve. Teaching this kind of sexual perversion and creating hate and suspicion for anybody, black, white, Asian, what, for doing that is not healthy. There's nothing good that can come from it. And yet it is the objective of so much of the left's political agenda. All right. Now, I did play the Rush Limbaugh one. That was actually the shortest one or shorter one. So the one that I want to play next is a soundbite I got, and it's some caller called in to Rush Limbaugh, and he was referring to his whole sexual perversion thing, and he added to it. It's the, the the last one I just played. I thought that was the long one. That was actually only six minutes. That's still very long. No, actually, the next one is longer yet. It's um, excuse me. It's like uh, it's eleven minutes. So I'll I'll play that next. Because you know what, everything I said earlier when I was recording the show that got lost on audacity is pretty much what I rounded up that uh, last time I had spoken before playing Rush. So that actually kind of makes things a little bit easier for me, I guess. But I ran out of things to say, too, at the same time, unfortunately. Um, Yeah, what was I going to say? Yeah, that was really good because I I made sure to listen to what I'm like this time, at least. I I usually do, but I made sure even with these longer ones that I'm listening. So I am not just putting, you know, just guessing on what I'm putting in the sound bites because I do listen to them when I you know, record the clips because I actually now physically have to record these clips as well. But yeah, I mean, he did mention uh, things that I've complained about for a long time of people victimizing themselves thanks to the Democrats, the left, making people think they are victims when they're not. Um, The sexual perversions, which those children, like the ones I got to work, deal with at work, who were children, you know, depending on their age, if they're in their 20s, um, not everyone's that way, but most of those people, 
um, are these people that were in school getting brainwashed into believing, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's a good thing um, for man and man to be in a relationship, woman and woman to be in a relationship. For you that do really bizarre sexual acts on animals and people and other things, you know, that's that, you know, they're getting, but these, that started well, quite a few, not when I was in school, but when some of these younger people that I have to work with now came in. And, and this belief also, I'm not saying this is true, but I'm just saying it's a freaking podcast. Get over it. Um, that, you know, that's why these people are so messed up. I mean, I'm messed up, but these people are really messed up. They got to deal with this younger generation now. You know, it, it's 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 pretty scary. OK, let me play this because it's a really long segment and I don't know how long I've I've been on the air. I'll, I'll figure it out. So I hope you enjoy it. I should like actually keep some type of timer now, I guess, if I do decide to go back to garage bands. So here we are. I'm going to play the one where Rush has his collar, and it's a little bit more than that, but Rush gets his collar about um, speaking up about the modern pagans, as I put it. Okay, here we go. And we're back, Rush Limbaugh, having more fun that a human being should be allowed to have. Here is Steve in West Hartford, Connecticut. Great to have you, sir. How are you? Oh, it's very good to speak with you, Mr. Limbaugh. How are you? Fine and dandy, sir. It's uh, great to have you on the program. Uh, well, I'm a, a high school English teacher, public schools, and uh, I cannot tell you um, how determined we are to make children into sexually sophisticated little beings. We, we really, really work on it very strenuously. And, um, and of course, it's not just, I mean, it's in the, the educational system, the uh, uh, public school system, but it's also everywhere in, in, in pop culture, everywhere. And, um, now, wait a minute. I, hold on a minute. When you say we work on making uh, our children <laughs> that's, that's uh, sexually sophisticated, for, are you, you know, are you talking I, about I you? No, I, I, I hate it. I despise it. I, I, I can't stand being a part of it. But I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the public school system. That's why I, I say we, you know, because okay, okay. I, I have to. I, 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 I'm disgusted that I have to. But, um, you know, you keep saying, where does this come from? And, and um, I, I've got a theory. I'd like to throw it out. Um, uh, you know, the, the ancient Christians were so severely persecuted by the, the pagans in their day because the Christians told them they couldn't do the things that they wanted to do. And, of course, this included, uh, you know, any kind of sexual deviancy that you can think of, uh, having sex with children and all this. Well, you know, uh, this seems to be very... Uh, the left seems to be very hostile towards modern Christianity as well, and I think this is what pagans look like. I think this is what they are. I think this is what they do. Wow. You're not... Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now we're dealing with the modern era pagans dealing <laughs> and battling with modern era Christians. Let me say something. One thing that you are dead on right about, and that is, I don't care what era you're talking about, the people in this country or anywhere else, but and let's, let's stick with the modern era. The view that these people, you call them pagans, I'll just call them the general left, the irreligious the view they have of Christians is of a domineering, demanding, you are not allowed to have fun. Sex is not to be enjoyed. It's only to have kids, and you are to feel guilty every time you do it, no matter what the reason. You are not supposed to enjoy life. You are supposed to have a strict moral code, and the purpose of that moral, moral code is to deny people happiness. Life is to be spent in an impossible quest of living decency and goodness in hopes of attaining heaven. The view that these people have of Christianity is prison. They really think Christianity is prison and that people who are smiling, happy Christians want to put everybody who isn't a Christian in some kind of religious jail. Well, and, and not coincidentally, that's exactly what the ancient pagans thought of the Christians. Exactly. You're... You're, you know, you're a bunch of party poopers. You're telling us we can't 
do what we want to do. And, and, uh, and my goodness, uh, part of realizing their wonderful vision for the future is making our children sexually sophisticated. What, what does that say about it? Wait a second. I understand your term, but there's nothing sophisticated about the perversions that they're being taught. Oh, no, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, they maybe oblivious. Maybe you things. mean enlightened, as the left <laughs> would define it. <laughs> they, that's exactly how they would define it. Yes, that's exactly what they do want. They want children to be sexually knowledgeable at a very young age. And I think it's unbelievably creepy. It, it, it's sexually it's really rebellious. Awful. It's sexually rebellious. This is, I think they want all of this to end up being a giant slap in the face at whoever these imaginary Christians they think are. I mean, it's, it's why ACT UP and these, and these people were marching into St. Patrick's in the early 90s and throwing condoms. They looked at the mm. Catholic, they, they, they demanded the Catholic Church reform to accept whatever they thought normalcy was. And when the Catholic Church said, no, we do not moderate. We are who we are. We have our religious beliefs and teachings, and we don't change with the wind, except this current pope might be doing that. But prior to him, oh, he, they he didn't. definitely does. And it infuriates them because it's they look at it as ultimate judgmentalism. And they don't want to be judged and they don't want to feel guilty when they're being judged as behaving in ways that are not helpful, productive. Or yeah, I think you're, you're you're pretty close. Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about it a long time, and, and I, I really do. I think what we're looking at is the face of modern paganism. That's, this is what pagans are like. This is what it looks like. This is how they act. That's, that's, uh, that's what I think, at least. Well, you know, I like that. I, I, it's... it's you know, I use that technique myself and explain like the the um, the attempt here to now get rid of Scott Pruitt, the EPA uh, administrator, or all of this lying BS they're telling on Trump. This is what pushing back against the establishment in this case looks like. It isn't going to be pretty, and they're not just going to sit around and acquiesce and understand they lost the election and therefore have to moderate and modify. No way, Jose. They're going to fight it. They consider Trump illegitimate, and pushing back is exactly what it looks like. And in a sense, the people you're calling pagans are pushing back at what they think the dominant religion of America is, practiced by the dominant race of America. And so they're pushing back against it. They're not going to accept it. And they're getting more and more powerful. As the, as the Democrat Party has incorporated and accepted all of this, accepted their money, accepted their ideological beliefs, and maybe put it even into policy in the party platform, they have a home for it now. And it's uh, they're doing everything they can to make sure that their enemies don't win. Their enemies here are the white majority, the white Christian majority. And so getting hold of young skulls full of mush as early as they can in school is is how they are fighting the battle. But again, folks, the thing you have to understand here, be it about illegal immigration or about teaching young people in grade school and middle school a bunch of sexual perversion techniques, it's not about helping these people. The great myth, the great myth of many is that the left cares about people, that the compassion in American politics is almost exclusively found in the Democrat Party. It's the exact opposite. Look at the people that vote for them. They're all angry. They're all miserable. They all feel left out in one way. They all need therapy. They're all constantly enraged. And you know why? Because nothing the Democrat Party ever promises them happens. Their lives do not get better. They have allowed themselves to become victims, thereby waiting for everybody else to do something for them because they've been convinced they can't do anything on their own because they're a victim the deck stacked against them. So they're waiting for the Democrat Party. They're waiting for the Democrats and the American left to make things better. How do they define that? Making things better is punishing their enemies, not really making things better for them. I defy anybody other than the wealthy Hollywood tech sector and the, and the Wall Street sector. Go out and find your average radical leftist Democrat voter, and you will not find a happy person. 
And you will not find a person satisfied with what the Democrat Party has done to improve life for those people. They, I think, have even given up on that. Their definition of satisfaction or happiness now is how much pain can be inflicted on their Republican conservative enemies. And if they see enough of it, they're happy. Their lives do not improve. Their attitudes don't change. Their moods do not uh, change. But they are made somewhat satisfied if they see their political enemies suffering or in pain or angry or losing elections or what have you. But to me, it is striking how many people vote for Democrats on the premise that Democrats are going to make their lives better. Look at the eight years of Obama and African-American unemployment. Look at one year of Trump and look at African-American unemployment. African-American unemployment skyrocketed under Obama, the first African-American president. One year of Donald Trump and African-American unemployment is at a record low. You look at any other economic measure, eight years of Obama, misery, with no end in sight. And Obama even said so. The new decline. The new normal. One year of Trump, all that's erased. And what's happening? The left is mad because eight years of Obama are being erased. Obama and Hillary are mad that Obama's agenda is being erased and unraveled. In one year, Trump has turned all this around for the benefit of any American who wants to participate. The left remains angry, left out, miserable, ticked off, enraged every day, refusing to participate in anything that would make their life better because they can't in their own mind. They've got to wait for the Democrats to do it or wait for government to do it. So you would think that people who are investing in their government or a political party to make their lives the most they can be. Those people are never going to be happy, and they aren't now. And the Democrats don't do one thing to change that. The Democrats just want more of those kinds of people, more angry, more disaffected, more bitter, more poor people to continue in the gigantic, misguided mission of electing Democrats. It's amazing what they get away with. Right in front of our faces. Okay, so I was listening to that, too. Listen to that last segment with everybody else, so that's good. Um, yeah, I only have one more segment to play, so that's good for everyone. Um, again, everything I had put together earlier was lost, and, you know, thank goodness i was able to find or well find the strength to do this whole freaking show all over again but yeah he covered a lot rush he talked about um white privilege and um the segment before that was also about the perversions in schools and obviously this one i forgot to mention did have that teacher right off the bat which was perfect um, of the the caller who called in, who was a school teacher, about these liberal, the liberal left, pretty much being the pagans of today, uh, the liberal left teachers, and um, you know, perverting these young kids into um, their ideas. Um, the white privilege was the last thing he talked about, which was. Is good for me because my last sound clip was a continuation um, from a different part of Thursday's show about white privilege. So I'm going to play that now because I really don't have much more to say. I did want to get these in. And, um, you know, this is an experiment because, again, I, I'm still going to be fiddling around with garage bands if I'm going to go back to that from Audacity. I prefer... Audacity, but Audacity is causing too many complications. It's become, it had became too difficult for me to use tonight, so I end up using GarageBand. So I hope this sounds all right for everyone who may listen to me, which is usually not that many people. So anyway, let me just play this last segment. Don't worry, it's not that long. It's actually um, a lot shorter than the other one. It's about half the length. It's still long, I guess saying that but um yeah let me just play it right now okay here we go folks
Now, by the way, I don't think that the left thinks they're turning people into better people with this really perverted sex education. I mean, they're, 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 they're teaching sadomasochism. They're teaching um, uh, anal sex, how to do it. They're, they're teaching asphyxiation. They're, they're, uh, they're, they're teaching really way out of the mainstream things at, at, in grade school, now in, in middle school. So the question, why are they doing it? I don't think they're doing it for the benefit of these kids. I don't think anybody's that stupid. I think this is all about undermining America. I think it's I think it's an attack on traditions, institutions that have defined the country's greatness. It's an attack on anything and everything having to do with what these people think is an evil majority. And to them, the evil majority is all white people, primarily white Christians. And so now that's how we get the white privilege curriculum. And we're teaching everybody what's wrong with that. White privilege is being taught as the reason everything that's bad in this country is bad. White privilege, climate change. White privilege, racism. White privilege, inequality. White privilege, poverty. White privilege means spirited extremism. White privilege, anti-immigration. White privilege is, is being targeted as the reason for all of this unfairness and all of this mean-spiritedness. Anyway, to the phones we return. This is Mario, Tom's River, New Jersey. Glad you waited, Mario. What's happening? Hey, Rush, a quick question. Yeah. If America is such a horrible place to live, <clears throat> according to the Democrats, then why do they want anyone to either immigrate here and or move here? Another brilliant question. That's why I'm glad you held on. And once again, it illustrates that it's not about making life better for these people. If this country is so rotten, if there's so much injustice here, if there's so much discrimination, inequality, why would you want to introduce anybody to it? These people are pawns. These people are simply being used as the instruments for the left's ongoing claim to power. This is an illustration. I can't think of a better question. And a better answer to illustrate that they really don't care about people. One of the greatest political myths is that all compassion resides in the Democrat Party and all indifference and mean-spirited and what have you is on the Republican side. Nothing. It's the exact opposite, in fact. And the very idea that they are willing to have kids travel an entire country or two without their parents running the risk of serious, uh, serious injury or death or illness just to get here and become Democrat voters, what does it really say about their thoughts and their compassion for these people? Because once they do get here, they're never going to escape the bonds of poverty by design. And if you're a Democrat voter in poverty, you're stuck. If you're a Democrat voter and you're a minority and you're waiting for the Democrats to make life meaningful, you're stuck. They're never going to do anything for you. Because the dirty little secret is, and this is true of so many areas of government, the last thing anybody wants is issues resolved. Issues resolved means businesses going out of business. For example, if racism were quote-unquote ever solved, then what would Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson or any of their heirs do? And it's true of so many. The State Department doesn't want Middle East peace. They want the ongoing conflict. They want the appearance that they're working hard to solve, but nobody wants it solved. The left does not want an end to border problems. They just they want the open border for the continued influx of people that are going to end up being their permanent underclass in utter defiance of the idea that they care about people. That is a great question. Did you have your own answer to it? That differs from mine? Well, it ties in a little bit with what you were just talking about. The um, traditions and foundations of America is what the left is against. They want to change it. So it's purposeful. They want to tear down everything that we, you and I, think is right about this country, which goes back to our foundations and our moral code, which is based, uh, biblically based moral code. They, they hate the Bible. They don't. They hate when we put our hand on the Bible. And Christians represent that. They hate the freaking they're, anthem now. They hate the freaking they, before yeah. sporting events. They don't even want any part of that. They they're uh, they want to tear down what our country is. That's why they're 
they've become exactly. The exactly. That, that's why there is never, ever any attempt to have any of these immigrants illegally assimilate and become quote unquote Americans. That's not on the objective. Not on the agenda. Anyway, that's great, Mario. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, that was the last segment of my Rush Clips. So I hope you enjoy those tonight. I know I did. I re-listened to everything. And um, to me, I thought it was important for people to um, hear this stuff. You know, um, unfortunately, I ran into some, you know, problems tonight with my show and getting this actually down because I was pretty happy with what I did earlier tonight. And now it's like, going on three o'clock in the morning the witching hour so the pagans are going to be happy they're going to be coming after me after uh i finish this show um yeah so folks i hope you enjoy this i apologize that i don't do them quite as normally as i used to because i used to do one at least almost every night but i first started a couple years ago and then i you know cut back to at least once a week because after a while, yeah, it gets a little redundant, you know, doing this stuff every single night. And when you take longer breaks, it's pretty good because then you have more to talk about. But again, I did run in, into a lot of issues tonight, so that did not help. And, you know, I think I did an okay show, the one I did earlier on tonight that nobody will ever hear because it got lost in in on the desktop. It, it crashed under audacity and nobody's going to know what it sounded like so the only one who knows is me so thank you again um for listening to me and uh this coming friday i'm going to a concert with my friend matt and it will be uh um what do you call it a his name is christopher cross really popular back in the 80s it's easy listening and i liked it back when i was you know Actually, a teenager, I used to love Christopher Cross. A lot of his music were in different movies. Um, I used to watch General Hospital back in the day, and he sang this song called Luke and Laura. It became very popular. So, you know, he did a uh, theme song for the movie Arthur. Arthur, because I'm bad with certain words, a lot of words, actually. Almost everything in the English. English uh, see, there I go. Every word in the English language, I can't say any of them, so I'm just bad all the way around. So, um, yeah, and I'm very tired, by the way, at this point. I'm just glad I got this finished. I hope it sounds okay. I will listen to it once I put all the finishing touches on this. And um, bottom line is, next weekend, maybe I can do a show during a weekend if I'm not working. I don't know yet, because it's going to be a short week. And, um, you know... Don't mind when I can get a little extra overtime in here and there. So anyway, everyone, thank you so much for listening to my show, if you do. And if you enjoy what you hear, try to get other people to tune in. But the fact that I don't do them that often, it's not that hard to listen to, you know, uh, my programs. Because there's a lot less of them than there used to be. So thanks again. And this is Walter from the iWalter Show. And I am signing off for now.